This week on Arizona Illustrated, a recap of our 2022 Rocky Mountain Emmy Award winning stories. And looking at these footprints wander off into the distance took me to that place in a way that no other discovery has ever made. From discovering ancient footprints to current border issues. The fence that they're putting in is uh, trying to divide us, and yet uh, you can't divide family, you can't divide culture. All the way to space and beyond. One of these days, these mirrors are going to be in the world's largest telescope, and they're going to be discovering things that could not be seen with any previous telescope. Hello and welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. Each year, regional chapters of the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences recognize and reward excellence in their broadcasting communities with Emmy Awards. Now, this year, Arizona Public Media was nominated for Emmys in 16 different categories, the most of any public broadcaster in the region. And this show won Emmys in four different categories. First up, producer Brian Nelson and photographer John DeSoto won their Emmys in the category Historical Cultural Short Form Content for their story, Footprints from the Past. I really, really enjoy working in the Southwest and working in the White Sands area in particular has been quite a remarkable experience for a variety of reasons. Just traveling out there, it's a beautiful area. Crossing the dunes, to me, always remind me of a, a sea of whipped cream. And uh, particularly in the mornings, the, you can see the mountains off to the, to the west, lit up by the morning sun and the, the white dunes. It's a real, it's a pleasure. It's quite a, uh, an honor to be allowed to, to work out there. Ever since I can remember, I've always had an interest in the past in some way, shape, or form. And my particular interest is the archaeology, the archaeological record of the earliest people in the Americas, but also the geologic context. And we had already been doing some work right in the area that, that turned out to be this archaeological site. And so when the tracks were discovered, that was some of the first evidence of the age and context of these tracks. Yeah, Vance, I think the tracks are... Probably in this area here. Yeah, I think you're right. The stratigraphy is almost identical. The tracks were found in stream deposits. This, this area, most of the area was in a lake, but on the, on the east side of the basin, there were freshwater streams coming in off the mountains. Every time the stream would flood, it would bury some tracks, and then the people would come back later and make some more tracks, and then there would be another flood cycle. So a couple of, there were a couple of ways of approaching this. One was to document the tracks that were already exposed, mapping them in, in considerable detail, excavating them. What you tend to see is a discoloration because the, the sediment filling the track will, will often be a slightly different color. Seeing the footprints it was the most amazing thing I think I have ever seen in my life. Putting together the idea that people had been there six to 8,000 years earlier than had been documented previously. And this isn't just a stray tool, a broken piece of rock, something that might be questionable. This is actual people's footprints and 
footprints from mammoths, giant ground sloths, saber-toothed cats, dire wolves. Human beings were there when all of these humongous animals were walking this landscape. My moment of connection was when I was able to put my bare foot next to one of the footprints. And with permission then, I put my foot on the footprint itself, which fit pretty well. So about a woman's size eight shoe or a 39 or 38 in European size. An interesting thing about this in, in my experience in archaeology is that what you're dealing with are, are literally moments in time. If you think about how long it takes to make a trackway, say, across my office, a couple of seconds. So you, you can you look at these tracks and, you know, you, you're looking at where somebody literally just walked across the landscape 23,000 years ago in the space of a couple of seconds. And it's it's, it's quite remarkable when, when we first saw those. The, the peopling of the Americas is the last great migration in human history. The dating we have right now suggests that these footprints span time from about 23,000 years ago to about 21,000 years ago, and that's 10,000 years older than the oldest well-documented occupation, human occupation of North America, the, the Clovis people, named after a, a site, well-known site near Clovis, New Mexico. So it, it's, it's a huge leap in many ways, a leap in time, a leap of imagination that we have people living in the Americas 10,000 years earlier than Clovis. It causes archeologists to stop and think about what has been the primary paradigm, the idea that Clovis were the first people here in North America. As both an American Indian and an archeologist, what I've been doing over most of my career has been acting as a liaison between the two schools and really trying to bring more American Indian issues, concerns, and voices into the practice of archeology span and to the interpretation of the archaeological record. Whether or not this will impact American Indian ideas about their history on the continent, it remains to be seen. Scientifically, this is further proof that the time depth, of the deep time of American Indian occupation of North America is there. This area where the footprints, where the tracks were found, the discovery was made due to wind erosion. So between the time they're first exposed until they're pretty much gone, it's just a few years. So this is, a, this is a whole nother issue out there is how to preserve them, how to interpret them. We know that there are more discoveries to be found. Every time we look, we find something new. I went into archaeology to try to understand about people, to try to understand about who they were, about where they came from, and looking at these footprints wander off into the distance took me to that place in a way that no other discovery has ever made. White Sands has given me the opportunity to begin to look really deeply into origins of, of Native Americans and Native American histories. The idea that we've added another 8,000 years to that deep history, it, is, it, it makes me smile and think about it. This is going to be one of those stories that people will be continuing to discuss Hopefully, my name, the names of my fellow researchers, all of us involved in White Sands, will continue to be a part of the footnote of history. From a look into the past, next we go to our southern border for a story that won in the serious news feature category. Producer Eliza Resnick, photographer Andrew Brown, and editor Maya Long won Emmys for their story, 
We are the water missing home. We all have dreams and visions. And one of the things that um, was told to me before wall construction, before COVID, was that there was, uh, the, there was death coming. My name is Amber Ortega, and my father is the late Melvin Ortega. We are both members of the Thahanwatham Nation, as well as descendants of Hiachidatham. My father, he left me breadcrumbs. I started to look through his research, and it pointed me here to this whole area. And I avoided this area for years because it was haunting. I grew up on the Tahanwatham Reservation, uh, the fourth village from the border. So my mother is Tahanwatham, my father is Tahanwatham. My father didn't know he was Hia Chiratham. And so that's where the Hia Chiratham piece comes in. He made a video about the Hia Chiratham. We are Hia Chiratham. There are still over 1,000 of us living in southwestern region of Arizona and northwestern Sonora, Mexico. In the early 1900s, noted historians, anthropologists, and archaeologists claimed the Hiachidatham were extinct. There is a strong history of the Hiachidatham fighting for recognition, fighting for land rights. Because of a piece of paper written by an outsider, we have been denied the Autumn basic human rights. This is our homeland, the land of the Hiachirata. It's felt here. Our people were from here. They lived here. They gathered. They stayed. And it, it was that way for long before. And it's been erased from, from, even, from even us. The first time I ever saw Kitsil Pekitsil was through a video from my father. If you're a reader and you read stories and you hear about Oasis, You've stepped into that story because this is what it is. It's an oasis. I am Hiachid Autumn, Sonora Autumn, and Tohono Autumn. My family lived here. My grandfather lived here. They have orchards here, but our orchards went clear into what is Mexico now. There was no border there. The fence that they're putting in is uh, trying to divide us and yet, uh, you can't divide family. You can't divide culture. My great-great-grandfather is buried there. I have other family members that are buried there. And my grandfather always told me, don't ever forget where you came from. Every time he'd bring me over here and we'd be walking around, he'd say, don't ever forget this place. Don't forget the people here. Don't leave your people here. Why did all of a sudden, when the fence started coming nearer and nearer, and you have blasting? Fire in the hole. And you have over a hundred, I don't know how many trucks go through here, heavy, heavy trucks. And then they have to dig every five miles to pull water out so they can do their cement. They're telling us it has no effect whatsoever. 
But why in the short period of time when they started from that hill did this happen here? One of the things they didn't acknowledge is the generational pain that it kicked up, the generational trauma. We've lived it, and as Indigenous people, we're continuously living it. We are the bulldozed and violated land as well. We are the cactus displaced far from its home. We are the turtle that has come out of shell to face. We are the water missing home. America, let me divide your families. Let me get an iron blade and drag it across your heart. And maybe then will you only understand what we feel and what we see here today. So we spend the rest of the hour in Arizona looking at how Odom Land and Water Defenders are leading a campaign against the construction of the U.S.-Mexico border wall near a sacred spring inside the Oregon Pipe National Monument. We don't want anyone to get hurt! No! 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 You'll never understand the way we feel that this wall is total destruction to mankind. On September 9th of 2020, construction was reaching the spring. My heart was pounding. and I saw that they were attempting to cut through the land. No more! No more! No more! No more! And we couldn't have them do that. I stood there singing. That's all I could do is sing as they yelled and they encroached. I do not give you permission, no. And that's how I got arrested. Accountability was a goal, and I knew that there will be consequences. And whether the charges be dismissed or not, it does feel good to say that for that day, we were able to hold them accountable and stop construction. That day, we were able to stop the desecration of our sacred site. That day, we were able to utilize our voices and speak up against imperialism and against authority, against greed, against power. That day, we were able to be here at Chidatum, and it felt so good. It felt so good. There are over 1,000 Piachet, and we would like to tell you that we are alive and working to establish a community made up of our Aboriginal territory. So we as Piachet Autumn can finally become full participants in our rights as part of the Tahana Autumn Nation. We for a complete list of all of Arizona Public Media's Emmy nominees and awardees, head over to azpm.org slash Emmys 2022.
Our producer, Brian Nelson, won an impressive three Emmy Awards, and he teamed up with the great Bob Lindbergh for this next story, Mirrors for Magellan, where they were awarded Emmys in the technology content category. The Giant Magellan Telescope, or GMT, is a telescope with seven 8.4 meter primary mirrors that will be connected and supported together to work as one giant 24.5 meter in diameter mirror. That is 10 times larger than the Hubble Space Telescope and will see details 10 times sharper. We've completed the fabrication of two of the seven mirrors that we need for the primary mirror of GMT. We're working on the third, fourth, and fifth at various stages of manufacture, and we just cast, just started making the sixth mirror. The seventh mirror will be cast in two years. We're hoping to see first light in 2029. Well, the Richard F. Karras Mirror Lab is unique in several ways. The most obvious is that we do make the biggest mirrors in the world. Uh, more important than that, they're the only big lightweight mirrors. So they, they're the only mirrors that have the ideal mechanical and thermal properties to hold their shape accurately in the telescope. I came into this job in an uncommon way. I started out a, as an astronomer when I was young, a professional astronomer. Uh, but I was finding that I was more interested in building equipment than studying stars and galaxies. Uh, fortunately, I had the opportunity to meet Roger Angel. Roger, uh, working mostly with John Hill, developed the methods of melting the glass to form this lightweight structure. So they started working on this around 1980. But by 1983, they had settled on the method that's almost identical to what we're still using today. So I got my PhD here at the University of Arizona, and I arrived in the fall of 1984, shortly after Roger and John had started uh, and developing the techniques that would lead to the spin cast mirrors. I still remember going and roasting marshmallows uh, off of one of the early furnaces. And while that was going on, the plans were being made to build the mirror lab under the stands of Arizona Stadium. And then that was completed just a, a few years later. You know, Roger Angel's vision was to have bigger and bigger mirrors, so we needed more space. And that's where this started, way back in the late 80s. The real estate here was available, and it started as one hall, and it is now three halls. It is uh, we, we now have a, a casting hall, a polishing hall, and an integration hall. And that's what it takes to fabricate multiple 8.4 meter mirrors. So it, it takes us roughly four years to make a mirror, and about the first year of that is the whole casting process, including building the mold, and the long cooling that has to go on. We, we actually do spend four months building this mold that is filled with 1,700 hexagonal boxes. It, when the glass melts and flows around those boxes, that'll form the cavities in the honeycomb. The glass is piled on top of it. We receive it in chunks. Uh, we buy it from the Japanese company Ohara, and they have a process that is perfect for our needs. They melt the glass in one-ton clay pots and then break it carefully into chunks. And we'll pile those carefully on top of the mold, then enclose it in the furnace, heat it over about five days. And at that point, the glass, uh, it doesn't get very runny. It has a consistency like molasses. The atoms will finally get locked in place at about 500 degrees C. That gives you the structure that you need for a mirror. It's got the ideal mechanical and thermal properties, but it doesn't have an accurate optical surface yet. The final three years are grinding and polishing, and that's almost all about 
achieving the accurate surface. And it's the polishing process that will eventually produce this surface that's accurate to a millionth of an inch. As we're analyzing these structural processes, we always have to be very aware of the stresses that are put into the glass. There's always the concern about stress because glass is a fragile material. We all know that. There's a reason why everyone at the, at the mirror lab is fairly conservative in how you handle the mirrors and how you get the final figure that you want. The current manager of operations, Stuart Weinberger, has done a particularly impressive job over the last year during the pandemic. The first challenge was just getting back into the lab. So we sent everybody home back in mid-March, and then we had to come up with a plan to describe how is it we could perform operations in a safe manner. Now, fortunately, these, these halls are very large, so it's fairly easy to keep people separated. So we only brought in those people that had to work. Most of our scientists and engineers, they operate from home. And that still occurs to this day. Keep the personnel density down and we keep people safe. Now the Mira Lab is at its heart, the people, the talented women and men that use their science, their engineering and their artistry to make truly remarkable and unique optics for telescopes. The real motivation for everything we're doing, and, and I feel this, is to enable the amazing science, the stunning discoveries that are someday going to be made. I mean, it's happened every time there's a big increase in the size of a telescope. One of these days, these mirrors are going to be in the world's largest telescope, and they're gonna be discovering things that could not be seen with any previous telescope. Roger and John started 40 years ago. It's gonna take us another 10 years to finish it. And the young women and men that will actually use it to look for life on planets around other stars are probably in their 20s right now. So it really is our equivalent of modern cathedral building. We're all looking to the future and dreaming about what subsequent generations are going to learn with our effort. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Tom McNamara, and we'll see you next week for a special holiday edition of Arizona Illustrated.